Welcome to On Software, conversations with the industry's leading experts on a wide range of programming and development topics. You can access related resources, recommended reading, special offers, and more when you visit the On Software Resource Center at informit.com slash software center. Hello, and welcome to a special podcast. I am Rex Black, president of RBCS, a worldwide testing and quality assurance firm providing training, consulting, and outsourcing services to clients ranging from small startups to Fortune 20 global enterprises. I'm also the author of eight books on the topic of software testing and quality, which is why I'm really pleased today to have the opportunity to talk to another author, Capers Jones, about his latest book. If you don't know him, Capers Jones is currently the president of Capers Jones & Associates, LLC. He is also the founder and former chairman of Software Productivity Research, LLC, or SPR. He holds the title of Chief Scientist Emeritus at SPR. Capers Jones founded SPR in 1984. Before founding SPR, Capers was Assistant Director of Programming Technology for the ITT Corporation, the Programming Technology Center in Stratford, Connecticut. He was also a manager and software researcher at IBM in California, where he designed IBM's first software cost estimating tool in 1973. Capers Jones is a well-known author and international public speaker. Some of his books have been translated into five languages. His two most recent books are Software Engineering Best Practices and The Economics of Software Quality. Among his other book titles are Patterns of Software Systems Failure and Success, Applied Software Management, Software Quality, Analysis and Guidelines for Success, Software Cost Estimation, and Software Assessments, Benchmarks, and Best Practices. Today, Capers and I will talk about the economics of software quality. In that book, Capers Jones and Olivier Bonsignor show how to systematically measure the economic impact of quality and how to use this information to deliver far more business value. For more information and to purchase, visit informant.com slash ESQ. So Capers, let's talk about your new book. Can you give our listeners a brief description of the book and its main themes? Well, thank you, Rex. Um, the book is about the economics of software quality. And the reason that I had to write such a book together with Olivier is because many companies don't actually measure quality. And when they do try to measure it, they end up using metrics such as cost per defect or lines of code that actually distort the economic value of quality and make it difficult to see where the real advantages are. For example, um, cost per defect tends to penalize high quality and achieve its lowest values where the number of bugs is greatest. And lines of code metrics, of course, can't be used to measure requirements and design defects, which outnumber coding defects, and they also tend to penalize high-level languages. So the bottom line is that for a long time, the industry has suffered under a misapprehension that high quality comes with high costs. But when you measure properly, when you um, use, say, for example, function point metrics for normalizing the data, you discover that high quality ends up with lower cost, shorter schedules, and significant reductions in maintenance costs all at the same time. But in order to see these economic advantages, you have to know how to measure quality and get the numbers right. Great. I really enjoyed reviewing the book because there are so many excellent points raised, such as the ones that you just mentioned, and they're all demonstrated with data. We see a lot of our clients, both large and small, um, making some really critical decisions about how to manage their software process and software quality without relying on data. So do you have any thoughts on we as, as software engineers don't rely more on data in our management and decision making? Well, I wish the software engineering field did rely more on data, but unfortunately the level of sophistication in software engineering is roughly equivalent to the level of sophistication of the medical profession in the days before sterile surgical processes were in, um, introduced back in the days before surgeons sterilized their instruments prior to operating. What I mean by that is that a lot of companies do not pay attention to bugs before testing starts, which means that requirements and design bugs are still present and end up in the software, and they're almost invisible to some kinds of testing. It means that they don't do pre-test static analysis or pre-test inspections. They often don't use trained and certified testing personnel so that their test case designs are somewhat amateurish. They try to let um, 
kind of casually trained developers do most of the testing. And the bottom line is that they end up delivering far too many bugs to clients. They spend far too much time during the test cycle because there are too many bugs when testing starts. And they have a very unbalanced combination of high cost and poor quality, primarily because they don't measure well enough to know what the real advantages are. Yeah, yeah, we saw an example of that with a client not too long ago where um, based on the data that they had, which was kind of sketchy, but it was it was reliable enough, we were able to estimate that they had uh, excess defect costs somewhere in the neighborhood of anywhere from $100 million uh, a year to $250 million a year on a billion-dollar annual IT budget. So, um, And that's exactly, for exactly the reasons that you just outlined of, letting this huge tsunami of bugs flood into the testing process and overwhelm it and then be um, it was very difficult for them to, to recover once they, they got into that situation. Yes, most projects that run late seem to be on time until testing starts. And then because of the unexpected deluge of bugs, the testing schedule t- stretches out to two or three times what was anticipated, sometimes two or three shifts every day. And at that point, it's too late to make an effective recovery because the bugs are already there. You have to keep them out before testing begins in order to have a cost-effective development cycle. Yeah. Well, what's really stunning sometimes in those situations is that, that companies, um, even when you point that reality out to them, um, refuse to accept it. Um, we've had some clients where we, we explained, look, this is what's happening. You're not getting the bugs out soon enough, and this is why your testing processes are blowing up. And they say, well, yes, we understand that, but we don't have time to do design reviews and, and requirements reviews. <laughs> it's kind of difficult to explain. No, the reason that you, you, you know, if you don't have time, you don't have any time not to do those things. And, and it's sometimes hard for them to see that. Yes, they get into a circular loop kind of situation. And they think they don't have time, little realizing that if they did pre-test inspections or static analysis, the testing cycle would be so much shorter that they would actually deliver early. Mm, yes, I remember one of the uh, things that I um, that really jumped out at me in your book was uh, you had an, a, a chapter where you talked about uh, accumulated technical debt, and just had some some stunning figures on on the, the accumulations of technical debt in some organizations. Can can you maybe uh, explain for our, our listeners a little bit more about that analysis that you did? Yes, technical debt um, is in a section that Olivier has written, too, so he'll talk more about it, I suspect, but the the gist of the idea is this. Technical debt is the concept that if you skimp on defect removal and defect prevention while you're building software, when you finally deliver it, you're going to pay an ever-increasing amount of money for warranty repairs and fixing the bugs that you failed to eliminate before the software was delivered. It's like paying interest on a loan. Um, And this technical debt stretches out for years and years and years because in any given calendar year, you're not likely to find more than, say, 25 or 30 percent of the bugs that were delivered. So you have at least a four- to six-year period, plus the fact that there's a situation called bad fix injection. Something like 7 percent of your attempts to fix a bug add a new bug that wasn't there before. So you have kind of a compound interest that stretches out downstream. So the basic idea to reduce technical debt is to prevent or remove as many bugs as possible before testing begins, and then to achieve very high efficiency test cases and uh, test stages by using certified test personnel and scientific methods for designing test cases, which will give you higher coverage with reduced number of test cases. And that combination should raise your overall defect removal efficiency from today's average of maybe 85% up to 99%, which means that your technical debt, which today is millions of dollars every year, would be cut down to almost nothing. Nice nice suggestions there. So now to pick up on something that you mentioned, um, you talk about on average uh, 7% of um, defects are, are uh, bad fixes, um, which is, is sometimes referred to in the testing world as regression. Um, now we've we've noticed something interesting with some of our clients where we we do an analysis on what what the percentage of uh, bugs are that are regression bugs or bad fixes, and in some cases we've noticed um, significantly higher than seven percent, and um, I've generally attributed that to 
the uh, presence of uh, what's so-called uh, defect clusters or, or, or um, you know, uh, highly unmaintainable code that also has a lot of bugs in it. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on that situation and what companies that, that find themselves with excess bad fix uh, introduction can, can do to get out of it? I do have some thoughts and also some data, and my data confirms yours. It was discovered back in the late 1970s at IBM that bugs are not randomly distributed through the modules of big systems. They tend to clump in a small number of places called, at IBM, error-prone modules. And in one extreme example, um, for a very buggy product that had 425 modules, 300 of them were zero defect modules that never got any bugs, and 57% of the entire customer-reported bug rate came in from only 31 modules out of 425. And those things, the bad fix injection rate for those can approach 50%, much higher than the 7% average. So um, they are often so complicated and so difficult to fix that they need to be surgically removed. In other words, you can't really repair them in place. You have to isolate them and then develop better, newer modules using better techniques to replace the ones that are error prone. Right. So basically, uh, re-engineering or refactoring or whatever the, the the buzzword du jour is for that, but get in there and cut that bad stuff out and, and and replace it with good code. Yes. And one caveat is, if you let the people try to do it who built the error prone module in the first place, you may end up with a new error prone module that's just as bad as the first one. So you have to be sure that you either use better people or better technologies on the replacement version because you don't want a second generation error prone module. Right. Right. Yeah, it's it's difficult enough to convince management in many situations of the need to do that. Um, they, they, you know, schedules are so tight and and budgets are so tight. And you say, well, we we need to have two or three of our best programmers go off and um, spend two or three months or maybe more completely uh, re-engineering this one part of the system. Uh, many times, I would expect managers would react by saying. Well, gee, you know, that would be nice, but we really can't afford to do that right now. Maybe we'll do it later. And, of course, that's one of those those laters that, that uh, never comes. Do you have any advice to uh, listeners about uh, when you're in that situation, how to convince managers with, with data, how to make an economic argument that, that uh, investing that time really uh, is, is time well spent? Well, I've seen situations where when managers – um, of commercial software or outsource projects ignored error-prone modules, the client sued them. And when it was discovered in court that they had not paid sufficient attention to those things, obviously there was a serious penalty for those who, who didn't take proactive steps to remove them. If you don't have uh, uh, the kind of software where your clients might sue you for ignoring these things, it's more difficult to make the case. But in general, the higher management in the company the president, the board of directors, and the senior executives who are on top of the software people would welcome lowering the overall maintenance cost and the warranty repair cost because they are enormous. As a matter of fact, one of the problems, the social problems brought on by poor quality is the fact that company presidents and boards of directors as a class do not actually respect their software communities. They think that the software communities are less professional than the other parts of the company, primarily because they don't understand quality economics. They deliver software with far too many bugs. They're frequently late when they deliver software. And often, which is even worse, a significant percentage of software projects, the big ones, will be canceled and never get delivered at all, primarily because poor quality turned the return on investment from positive to negative. So the plug was pulled and the projects were never finished. Yeah, indeed. I've, uh, I've been involved in a couple postmortems on projects like that. And um it's uh, just um, amazing and, and somewhat depressing how how um, easily preventable uh, the the disasters were uh, in, in many cases. Um, how about for people who are on projects that um, that are still in progress and are still um, uh, savable, if you will, and uh, they see the signs of uh, the kind of problems that you're talking about. Um, you know, not not taking time to do design reviews, not taking time to do code reviews, not taking time to do requirements reviews. That sort of, uh, we'll uh, you know, we'll let all this stuff uh, sort itself out in uh, in uh, the uh, system testing or system integration testing phase. Any uh, tips to uh, 
people who find themselves in these kinds of, um, of emerging but still preventable disasters on how they should uh, educate their uh, managers about the economics of uh, putting the project back on the right path? Well, there's kind of a, a carrot and a stick set of suggestions. I've worked as an expert witness in 15 lawsuits, and what's interesting is that in all of the lawsuits where poor quality was part of the case, the technical um, employees, the software engineers and the test personnel and quality assurance knew about it and wrote letters and gave suggestions to management about these problems and suggested that they be fixed. It was the project managers who did not seem to pass on the information to the clients and to higher management because they naively hoped that those bugs and problems could be fixed um, in system tests or at some later point, but they weren't. So when the situation finally exploded and ended up in court, it turns out that management resistance to passing on critical information about quality to clients and higher management is the chief source of the problem. The technical workers, the testers, and the QA people all knew about it and wanted to fix the problems, but were actually prevented by management decisions. Now, the the, the carrot part, that was the stick part, is that um, if you require, as part of your monthly or weekly report, for managers to hire management that the first section be called something like red flag items and include quantifications of the number of bugs found compared to the number of bugs that were expected to be found and the significance of those bugs on the status of the project. If you can change the reporting requirements for software projects so that bug counts and their significance are elevated to the very first thing that gets reported, then managers will begin to take quality seriously and pretty soon the problems will go away. You won't have the same kind of problems because managers are suddenly required to um, report information that they had been concealing. Right, which is back to that old uh, management aphorism of, of what gets measured gets done, basically, and, and it's, it's a corollary that what, what doesn't get measured doesn't get done. So to the extent that uh, organizations don't have good metrics about uh, quality and, and defects, then that basically means it, it won't get managed. 